Hello, everyone, and welcome to our first workshop now in the afternoon. With me here, I have Alan, and he will uh, talk more about how to use Airflow. Alan is a machine learning engineer at H&M, and he will tell you more about himself. So, Alan, the stage is yours. Thank you oh. very much. Thank you very much, Christine. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining this workshop in Bygone Sweden 2021. Uh, today, we will walk you through and give a hands-on session on airflow for machine learning pipelines. So, so the goal for, of this workshop is to give you an experience about how to automate the processes of machine learning, like uh, training, prediction, and model management in a production environment. Myself, Alan, I'm a machine learning engineer at HNN, and along with my colleagues, Lini, Scott, and Nathan, we will take you through uh, this hands on workshop. This is an overall agenda of the workshop and how we plan to move through the next one and a half hours. First would be uh, and then the first would be about the environmental environment setup. We have already added the steps to follow in the description of the workshop in Python website. If you haven't done it yet, uh, we will go through them again in the next slide. And also the next steps to get the Docker containers up and running. Then following that, we will have a short description. We'll share a short description of what Airflow is and the current status in the versions that has been released right, right now. This section also includes the major changes that have that we have experienced after the migration from uh, the previous version, which is Airflow 1 to Airflow 2, and an overview of the components, which is based on the latest version. Then moving into the workshop, uh, we would go through running the running, go through the, the different components and services that are running as a part of the Docker Compose and then give you an overview about what Airflow UI is, what are the important parts in the Airflow UI, then how to trigger a training DAG, then go read logs through the UI and investigate errors in the prediction DAG. And finally, we will also help you to build a dynamic parallelization of that task using, using, the, using the minimal Python code. This would be followed by a quick overview of ML flow container that will also be spin up by the Docker Compose and also how to manage multiple model stages in ML flow. Before we move to the core of workshop, let's go through quickly about the prerequisite setup. We have containerized all the components that are essential to deploy ML pipelines in production in different images in the Docker Compose file. So that includes the major components such as Airflow, MLflow, and uh, develop environment. So as a prerequisite, the initial steps would be to install Docker Desktop. So if you haven't done that already, you can do it. Uh, you can try to start doing these steps now. Install the Docker Desktop, start the Docker Desktop, and you can clone the repo with the repo link that you see it here. And the same also will be shared in the chat right now. Once the repo is cloned, then you can go to the repo folder, either using your IDE or a terminal, then run these two commands, docker compose pull, which pull the pre-built images, and Docker. then once it is complete, then you can run docker compose up, which would start, start all those uh, containers. Once the once it is up and running, you can check the status of containers using Docker PS. And one thing to keep in mind is that when you install the Docker desktop and before uh, start, I mean once it is started, uh, make sure that you update the Docker settings with a minimum resources of uh, two CPU and three GB memory. So while you set up the environment, I'll give you a quick 
please continue with the setting up. Uh, I'll give you a quick overview of what are the components that we are going to demonstrate today and what are included in the Docker Compose file. So primarily we have multiple services in Docker Compose uh, files such as Airflow web server, scheduler, then separate Airflow worker service, and then an init container, which would check if the Airflow versions are up to date and if it's not up to date, which would do the upgrade by itself. Um, and also these containers also expose the Airflow related ports, such as the Airflow web server exposes the port for Airflow UI, and also there is uh, the scheduler which exposes exposes the port for the celery as well, where we could see and track what how many what how many what is how many uh, workers are running how many jobs are running in the worker right now and we can keep track of it uh, within the celery UI. We'll go in detail into that later. Addition to this, there are a couple of other services such as uh, Postgres. We have two Postgres services. One is for Airflow and one is for MLflow. And there is a separate container for MLflow with MLflow UI. And also there is another uh, service which is committed out right now in the code base, which is for the developer environment. So the development environment uh, contains all the required components that are mentioned in the requirements.txt, which includes Airflow, MLflow, and other Python libraries like scikit-learn uh, and many others which are required for the, for the developed environment. Since we won't be using the dev container for this workshop, we have committed it out to reduce the load on your machines during this workshop. But uh, feel free to uncomment those lines in the Docker Compose to spin up the develop com container to experience an end-to-end -end code development inside a container. So it's, it's, it's ready, but just that it's committed out uh, to reduce the load on the machine. Yeah, uh, assuming that at least some of you have completed the installation and the setup of prerequisites for this workshop, uh, I think we can proceed with a brief description about Airflow and its components. So we have, have, we have a couple of slides which is more descriptive rather than uh, the hands-on so that if you haven't done it already, you could proceed with those steps of setting up the prerequisites. And uh, those who are, uh, if by some reason, if you're unable to meet the prerequisites, uh, it should be totally fine since I would be demoing uh, the demonstrating the exercises and the solutions so that you can follow along. And, and then we have, um, we have one question uh, about the setup in Linux. Do you have any, uh, anything to share about that? It was this, um, if there's a, limit uh, to the resources in Linux, I guess, uh, when setting I, up Docker. Yeah, so about Linux, I have had a quick check on uh, the ways, but I found in one of the Stack Overflow page that in Linux, uh, there is no need to set it up separately. It's just that uh, whatever is available in the Linux machine, it would be available for the Docker images as well. So I, okay. I was it should be, uh, I mean, you do not need to set that limit separately. You can just start uh, pulling the Docker image and running that. Okay, great, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you for the question. Right, so uh, as I mentioned, uh, if you haven't if you are not able to meet the prerequisites, uh, it should be fine because we will be. I'll be giving you a, a detailed a walkthrough on the solution as well. Now, moving about some of the basics of Airflow. Uh, Airflow is a platform uh, to programmatically author in Python, schedule and monitor workflows, which can be used for data engineering pipelines or machine learning pipelines and a lot more. Uh, the DAG or the directed cyclic graph is defined in Python scripts, which would give a tight integration with the projects, which is mostly based, based on Python. Uh, one of the best thing about, uh, about Airflow is that you can dynamically create the DAGs 
uh, based on the parameters that can be executed in a distributed manner as well. It provides a very interactive UI that gives you almost most of the control over the DAGs. You can view the DAG, which is in a graph kind of structure. Uh, you can trigger the DAGs and manage the progress. You can see the logs. And you know, if you want to stop the process, you can stop the DAG at some point and you can rerun the task from some point as well. Uh, and and comparing to a Python script, so you can define all the Python calls in a script. But uh, if you encounter any error at the point, at, the, at a specific point, you need to rerun the script all over again. So in Airflow, you can clear the task from that point of failure after fixing the issue or the errors in case. Uh, over the years, the community support have increased tremendously, which is uh, visible in this graph, uh, which is shown as a comparison with other similar frameworks. And a, a huge support of operators where you can easily connect to other services as well. Um, there has been significant, so when we talk about the version difference uh, from version one to two, there has been significant changes in all areas and components with the version difference, with the version upgrade. Uh, Airflow has provided a visual refresh and updated some of the styling, uh, a completely redesigned scheduler, which is much more stable and performance improvement in scheduler is one of the major changes that we have noticed. Uh, and the new API, uh, the REST API support gives authorization uh, capabilities that provides third-party access easier. And then one of the major change, uh, another set of major changes are versioning and serialization. So it, it stores multiple DAGs as version if there is a version, if, there, if one DAG was triggered with one version, it stores that entire DAG in a serialized format uh, in the database. So by default, it stores it as a JSON format, uh, and th that handles the versioning of the DAGs. This process simplifies the airflow setup and deployment of DAGs. Uh, now moving to the major components of airflow. So we have a scheduler, which is the core of, Air, of Airflow framework, which handles both triggering sh scheduled workflows and also which manages uh, submitting of the task to the executor or the worker node to, to run it. An executor which handles running tasks in the Airflow, uh, an executor is, is a component which handles running tasks. In the Airflow, default Airflow installation, this runs everything inside a scheduler, but most production stable executors actually push task execution out to the workers. Then we have the web server component, which presents a handy user interface to inspect, trigger, and debug the behavior of DAGs and tasks, which is similar to what I mentioned before, which we will go in detail later. Then the other component is a DAG file folder. So we have we should have a folder which contains all the DAG files and to which we point the scheduler that this is the DAG folder. So that scheduler can look into that DAG folder and refresh if any changes are made and identifies and updates the database with all the DAGs, which then later will be visible in the web server UI as well. Then we need a metadata database, uh, which is used by all the other components like the executor, the web server, and scheduler. So all the inputs, uh, all the information, such as the state of the DAG run, what is the DAG, and all the tasks in the DAG, all these are stored inside the metadata database. And that can be any database that we, it supports most of the common databases which are available right now. So the Docker Compose version, uh, which, has all, which you might have already seen in the code base, it is a miniature version of our production setup. So in HNM, 
we have been running airflow in production for over three years uh, started with a pre-stable version over time with different versions of airflow and increase or the improved stability uh, the current system uh, current infra of production system runs on kubernetes executor and since the since the demand of uh, resources and components in each task is different so sometimes the training task might need more resources than a simple uh, api call task so the resources requirement is different so we have made custom configuration to make the system scalable based on the demand and the needs at the same time optimizing the resource utilization by the implementation of resource management on each task level on different DAX. Uh, when it comes to operators, we use multiple operators. We, there are a huge selection of operators which are supported in Airflow, but these are the pro these are the primary ones that we use: Python operators, Bash, Hive, Databricks operators. And though we are using Kubernetes as our current executor, we have tried with Dask as well, uh, and for this workshop, we will be using the Celery Celer Executor. Yeah, it has been a, it has been too much talking right now, so let's uh, jump into the workshop. Uh, so, with all the containers up and running, uh, you should now be able to access the Airflow instance along with other components. So if you open your browser and go to localhost 8080, you should be able to access Airflow UI and the username and password are both Airflow. So then uh, we will go ahead with the DAGs and its overview, but before that one quick introduction a quick introduction or first look at what a DAG is and what the DAG structure is. So this is uh, this is how a typical DAG looks like. So it's a basic it's a simple it's a Python file. It should be a Python script. So in the first uh, step you import the pipe modules, the required modules. First you need to define a, define a DAG and then uh, you import the operators that you need then you define the DAG object by passing the required parameters sometimes you need to uh, set the number of retries of the task or sometimes you need to uh, set the maybe if you need an automatic schedule then you can specify that like a cron kind of command in the arguments uh, that is where you define the DAG then at the final stage you define the task so then that that's the final stage in the flow. Right. so let's move ahead uh, to the workshop part so assuming that Assuming that uh, you have spin up all the components, uh, the Docker Compose app is uh, complete. If you access localhost 8080 and enter the password Airflow, a username and password as Airflow, you should be able to see this screen, which have one DAG defined. So before that, so here you see the list of the DAGs and list of the DAGs and here you have the option to search the component, search the DAGs, search the DAGs based on the tag so we can tag it as well. Okay, so this is the tag that we have defined. You can search, filter the DAGs by tag or you can search the DAGs as well and here you can see how what is the status of the DAG. So at present it hasn't been triggered even once and there is no run that is ongoing. There is no DAG run that has failed. 
And here you can see the task level information, like how many tasks are running, how many tasks have failed, how many are queued, how many are up to retry, those kind of information. Then this gives the, they, these are the buttons which uh, refresh the DAG, trigger the DAG, and if you want to delete the DAG, you can delete the DAG from here itself. Moving into the, the DAG view. So this is the DAG that we, can, that we have defined in the Python code, which we will get into in a while. So the, this is the DAG, and the, each of them are different tasks. Each task has been split based on the purpose of this process of execution of this training process. So we have data extraction, data validation, preparation. We do the model training with hyperparameter tuning using hyperopt. Uh, we do the model evaluation. In the final stage, we validate the model and push the model to a new flow. So that is the. This is all about the first UI, and and based on the status, we can see the color coding around each task. So these are different possible status for the tasks in Airflow. Uh, and if you open localhost colon five thousand, you'll be able to see the different. Uh, you'll be able to have the first look at the ML flow UI. Currently, there are no experiments tracked, and there are no models registered as well. And then we have Flower, which is a celery UI in uh, in localhost double five double five. So here, there are no active ta active ta jobs running, no process jobs running, nothing is fake. Now let's trigger the training that so this play icon on the top right of the tag you'll see the trigger DAG option and we also have this option to trigger the DAG with config but we do not need any parameters to be passed in this stage uh, so we trigger the DAG. If you click on this graph view, you can see that currently this is in the queued state. Now it is complete because it is the dark green. And the same goes with others as well. So this is this one is also complete. This one is also complete. Now it is doing the model training. That's also complete. It is evaluating the model and now validating and pushing the model to a new flow. So that is complete as well. So now this tag execution is complete if you have if you go to the home screen you can see that one dag run has completed successfully and six tasks have completed successfully and the, and for each dag if you click on the dag you can see all these different options so this is where you can run with different sets of options and if you want to clear a particular task or rerun the task this is like a rerun option where you clear the task with downstream which clears all the tasks from that point itself and if you want to just clear only one task you can disable those options and you can you can mark the tasks as failed mark them as success as well the another important component here is the log. So if you click on the log button on the top, you can see all the logs that has been generated for that specific task. And going back, for example, if you have a look at the model training log, here itself, you can see the data which is logged from the code. And this is where it starts the hyperparameter tuning. And we have 10 iterations configured in the code. So it has completed the 10 iterations and found the best loss. In. And that will be the hyperparameter used uh, in the model. Now, uh, any questions? 
so far on this UI. All right. So now we can have a look into the code base to understand how. Sorry, Ellen, I was muted. Um, I think we had some uh, problems with the setup um, that, uh, like, the, the memory is running out and then it tries to restart what uh, Jan was describing in the chat. The minimum is not. Is it a possible that the minimum system requirements are not met with 3 GB memory and 2 GB? Mm. Yeah, I'm facing a similar issue, so I have a lot of noise here in the background. <laughs> Uh, are you in it? Yeah, I think the only issue that we have, and uh, Yan has also replied on it, is with respect to the, the source limitation, maybe. Yeah. And the user ASDFASDF yes. for the creative name is not able to execute it. Yeah, so if, if the uh, resource limitation is not met, then uh, the web server container, it tries to start running, it shuts down, then it restarts again. So all the others might be running. So it, the, what we have noticed as well is that by default, Docker sets 2 GB memory. So when it is only 2 GB memory, the web server keeps on restarting. So uh, that is uh, a non-issue. That's why we have specifically mentioned to set the minimum limit to 3 GB. OK. Yeah, I hope um, I hope you didn't give up uh, and that you can figure out later uh, how to set it up properly. Um, but thank yeah. you, Ellen, for uh, taking the time to answer. Nice. Thank you. So uh, this is the Docker Compose file, uh, which you just triggered the uh, for which you trigger the command and all the containers are running with. So here uh, we have the airflow common and we set all the parameters here. And then there are different services, Postgres for airflow, then we have Postgres for MLflow, then the Redis, which manages the queuing and airflow web server, scheduler, we have the worker, then init container, the flower, which gives the UI for salary. Then we have the MLflow container, which is the custom built container. Then this is the dev uh, image that I mentioned about, which is committed out. So these are the major components of all the Docker services that are running. Now let's have a look into the DAG folder. So the, the DAG folder is defined inside the DAG file is defined inside the DAGs folder. And here I have imported all the required libraries uh, and also imported the DAG here. And we have imported the Python operator, which is the operator that we, we are using in this exercise. And for all the tasks in this DAG as well. Then these are the default arguments that we have set. So this is what I mentioned about the number of retries or if you need to schedule a DAG, like a cron kind of scheduler, uh, we can specify that there. And then we uh, define the DAG here. So we define the DAG here and inside that we define multiple tasks. So all the tasks that you see in Airflow UI are defined in here as Python operator. So what we specify here is that, uh, what, what, what we exactly do here is that we also do have a config, config file, which is defined in the config folder, which we will get into 
in a way. And each of these tasks are defined here. And then at the end, how you interconnect them is using this option. So you, if you want data extraction if that to happen before the validation, and if this is the order that you want this to happen, you can use this operator uh, to define the DAO. So if I switch this from uh, like this, for example, then the DAG would be reordered that data after, that validation would happen after the train. I mean, this task would happen after the train. Uh, so this is how we define the DAG. There are a couple of other uh, ways or how, how you can manage parallelism. And if you want to split the tasks as well, uh, we'll get into that. Uh, when we define more about the prediction part. So as I mentioned here at the top, I'm defining what should be the config file uh, or the word or what are the parameters that I need to pass to be passed to each DAG, each run. So here I have the training config. Here I have specified the input file name or tuning and we have defined the maximum number of evals or the, and all the entire search space. Then, def, then the parameters for model tracking in ML flow, what should be the artifact path and what should be the registered model. So to just give you a quick overview on the primary advantage of clearing the task from the middle, I've, I've, I've shown earlier that this model training run was triggered with 10 evals. It is because I've specified 10 specifically here. So if I need to increase it to 20 and just retrain the model, I just have to update the file here. So what it would do is that if I just clear that specific task, this the, the, the config file will be, will be reread and the new config will be passed to the model training function to run 20 evals, evaluations. Let's try that. So in the model training, I have disabled them. I just want to run the task. It was downstream and recursive, which cleared all the tasks in succession as well. So now that is complete. Now let's have a look at the logs. So this is the second attempt, which I just triggered. So this is the first attempt, which ran with 10 evaluations. And this is the second attempt, which ran with 20 evaluations, and which have uh, much lesser, uh, much uh, lesser loss than the first one because of the number of uh, iterations. So this is an advantage where you can just clear the task from where you have you want to improve your code with, or if you have faced an error, then also you can do it from there. Then um, this is how it looks in MLflow. You can see that the model have been uh, tracked here, the first one and the second one as well. And in MLflow, you can if you open that particular experiment, you can see the best parameters uh, after the hyperparameter tuning and also the metrics uh, as well. And in artifacts, we can see, track all the model objects in pickle file or other values such as cross-validation as a CSV, all the fold outputs, you can add them as well uh, as artifacts. In artifacts, you can upload any file that you want. And in the code base, we are also, uh, we have also uploaded the models uh, or registered the models. So you can see that there are two versions, version one and version two. So the first one, first version would be linked to the first run with uh, 10 iterations. And the second one is with the 20 iterations. Now going back to the code. So here we have defined a Python operator uh for each task and this is an object of the python operator 
and we have defined the task ID, and this ID is what we would see in the FWI. This is the important part of each task, which says what should be the function that needs to be executed inside that specific task. So here we have in source folder, we have the training tasks file. So this task points to data extraction function inside training task. Sorry. Uh, so moving into the training task, training task, the first function is data extraction. So by default, whenever an airflow DAG is triggered, it is always associated to run ID. So each and every time uh, it uses a run ID. So as you can see here, by default, it is associated with the date time uh, of that specific run and when the run is triggered. And also there is that if it is a manual run, there will always be a prefix of manual underscore underscore. And then it, comes, it, it will be followed by the timestamp. Uh, so that is a or that is a parameter which is uh, created by Airflow and which would be passed automatically to each and every task. So that can be extracted here and can be used for multiple purposes. For example, if you need to read and write intermediate result to a specific folder, you can use this run ID parameter uh, to define the path. And then uh, we we have also in the training.py, we are also passing the training config. So all the values inside the training config also will be passed into, uh, into the function uh, as a dictionary. And that can be extracted uh, with that specific file name. So here I have added input file name, so which would read this specific file name. So that is how the DAG works. And adding to that, um, for simplicity, we, in each and every container uh, or the image definition, we have, we are mounting uh, the fo different folders inside the data folder. For example, in artifacts, it's all the models that are tracked in any flow, which is mounted as part. And this is the prediction, uh, sorry, not prediction, the training data. Training data file name is specified here. And we have the intermediate data, which is created by each and every DAG one. That is all about the data. Yeah. So that is all about the DAG structure and all how to trigger the DAG and also so what we have been what, what we have gone through so far is all about how to define the DAG uh, for a training and how you how this can be de defined in a production kind of environment where you can split the task how we can manage them and uh, how you can find the errors fix the bugs and also finally how that can be tracked uh, in 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 a different uh, model management framework and here we are using an flow uh, so this is all about that and how to see the values of the best parameters in in an flow uh, and one thing that i missed is this one okay so in flower you can see that how many tasks are active so for example so here you see nine right now, because the first run we triggered six, and then in Glader we cleared three tasks. So this shows the number of pros processed tasks and succeeded tasks here.
So there's a question. As you know, so um, so Mustafa, I see your question. Uh, do you uh, what do you see when you run Docker PS? Uh, can you just post that in the chat? If you if you see the status, so in bracket for each of the services that are running, you should be able to see the status of the of the container. And also, please make sure that you meet the minimum uh, set of requirements or the, set the resources in Docker settings. Uh, Alan, can you also show your uh, Docker PS output as well on the screen? Sure. So uh, everybody will know what it looks like and uh, maybe you can yeah. uh, revisit the components. So this is how it looks like in my Docker PS. So all these status should show healthy. Uh, and when the resources doesn't meet, then uh, it would typically show uh, restarting or unhealthy. That's what we have seen so far. All right. Uh, so moving on, uh, if I clear this task once again, or maybe I can trigger a new task. So if I trigger a new task. Here I can see the, so this is a preview, which is not that interactive. Uh, I would prefer uh, looking into the graph view more because we are more considering the latest run. So here in flower, you can see in real time, the number of active tasks and how many has processed. Uh, so this is a way to identify the number of tasks that are running. So in case there are like multiple uh processes running on multiple components and multiple users using the same production system then this is a way to identify the deadlocks or uh, if there are any resource management issues so yes So, uh, so moving on to the next part. Have you set the minimum requirement for Docker? So is it showing so? Oh, sorry. The main, most of us question about. Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay. Scott and I are looking into it. Okay. Perfect. Are there any other questions on this part of the training that before we move to the next part of uh, prediction that?
All right. Uh, so let's move to the next part uh, of the prediction diag. So switch the Git branch of the repo uh, to this branch. This branch, uh, the command will be shared in the chat. So I will check out my branch to the second one. And once you have checked out, check the airflow UI. And there should be there, there will be two DAGs here in the DAGs folder. And now the scheduler has picked up the new DAG file in the DAG folder. And you can see that you should be able to see this new DAG here in the homepage. So the prediction DAG is pretty straightforward. We fetch the input data from the input path based on the parameters that we have defined in the prediction config. Uh, and then we pull the model from ML flow from the production stage and predict the results. So that's the overall process of the prediction DAG. So if you, if you, those who have this environment set up uh, ready and who have triggered the training then uh, you can follow me along with this process of triggering the prediction that. You can click on the same icon and click on trigger DAG once you are inside the prediction DAG page. So here it has already started. It has completed the fetch, fetching of the input data but then uh, the second one at the prediction has failed. Now we will have a look into the log to understand what went wrong. So scrolling down, the task has failed because there are no versions of the model with the name and the stage production. So, uh, if you, go, if you have a look into the code, the training task, not the, not the training config, prediction DAG, the prediction config. So then we also have in the prediction DAG, we are using prediction DAGs dot get. So here we have defined the model name and also the stage as production. So it's trying to pull the model from the production stage. And if you have a look at ML flow, there are no models in production right now. But if you expand this, you can see that there has been three versions. The first one was with 10 iterations, second one was 20, third one was again with 10. But we might need this one because the loss was less in this one compared to others. So I have chose, chosen the version two and I'm moving the stage from none to production. So here I have moved the model stage to production of version two. And now I can go back to the prediction bag and refresh it. So uh, in terms of color coding, uh, in our code, we have defined uh, in the prediction DAG file in DAG's folder that uh, we need the number of retries as one. So it will try to, if, if a task fails, it we'll try to do a retry uh, after five minutes. You can reduce the time limit or, the, I mean, if you cannot afford a task to fail, then you can avoid this number of retries and set it to zero as well. 
uh, or if there is like uh, if 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 querying a database requires much number of retries because the database is not stable in those scenarios or API calls, you can increase the number of retries as well. These are like common scenario why you would need a retry. So here it is waiting for retry and it will try to do another attempt in five minutes and then it will fail. So before that, since we have already moved the production to move the model to production, we can clear the task from here. Clear the task, enable order refresh. So now it has completed. So the complete that prediction that execution has been complete. And you can see the log here as well. So this is the kind of prediction result that we have. And this output is written uh, into the data folder as well. Um, right. So now let's have a look into the code base of the prediction bar. So he, here we have the prediction config, and we are currently using only one since you, you see here that fetch input one, predict one, output result one, because in the prediction DAG, we are using this thread set names to identify the parallelism. So here we have defined the batch name to be the first item in the thread set names, which is one. So that is the reason uh, why this DAG is created only for the first set of inputs and predicts only for the first set. So looking at the input and the output. So this is how the input looks. And we have the prediction output as well in a separate file. So this is this is these are the actual values and these are the predicted values. Obviously, the the accuracy is not good at all. But uh, this is how we can compare the performance and uh, get the values out of the model uh, in the prediction that use a better model or increase the number of cleaning and identify a better set of parameters. Uh, more data as well, since it's a very small example data that we have. All right, a uh, couple of, um, yeah, so, so, uh, a couple of thoughts on how you can improve this structure uh, that uh, here we have defined that first should be the start which is a dummy operator then comes the get input which is a python operator object then predict then output result then finally we have the end uh, task which is another dummy operator so that's what you see here uh, and this is how we have defined this. Um, say, for example, uh, we have we we generate two set of results, and we need to output two results. Then uh, you can define something like this. So output result one, two, probably, and then this is. And you can define them in square brackets. Output result one, comma output result two. So by by this definition with the square brackets, what you're saying is that after this predict, then write this output result one and output result two in parallel, 
and then we can finally uh, end the task after both of them are complete. Uh, so, for example, if I refresh this, it should have refreshed already. See this. Uh, and there is a bad input error. Ah, okay, so it is because of the task name. So both these task names are the same. So I can uh, modify the task name like this. So that the task names won't be, task ID won't be identical. So it should be fine now. Yeah. The error is gone. Should be able to see it like this. So one, two. Okay, so this is how you define uh, if you want to uh, parallelize multiple tasks like this. Um, Let's rework this. Okay, so moving on to the core of uh, this hands on exercise, uh, the final step of the hands on exercise. Uh, here, as I mentioned earlier, uh, this entire process happens only for one set because we are getting the batch name for only the first item, which is one here. So here, the present name is one, uh, two, and three. But here, we do have the prediction input for all of them. But since we have hard coded to, to get the first one, to only, only to get the first one, it is doing it only for the first one. So this is. Uh, for example, this kind of scenario could be useful when you are uh, testing this environment where you want to test if it if the entire pipeline would work for one set of inputs. And if, if, if it works, then this can be very easily uh, parallelized. So, so you can, you can uh, make all the following tasks to run in parallel. It should be very straightforward by using a for loop where you can iterate to each of the batch name. And this new batch name would be used uh, across all the task IDs and also define the task name. And that would be reflected in the DAG as well. So I can give you all uh, about two minutes to try this uh, option. Uh, And see, uh, so once you have made this particular line as a for loop and uh, intended all the following lines until, until here, then uh, you should be able to see uh, see this prediction that which is distributed, which can be triggered to be distributed in parallel. Please do pause in the chat if you have any further questions. Yes. All right, so I assume that at least some of you might have succeeded in doing this, but if you haven't, so this is, please follow the steps that I do. So here, so in, this is this prediction config of pred set names is a list of three strings, which is one, two, and three. So I'll be iterating through each of them to make this happen. 
lagi for batch name so batch name would be each of the values from one to three so this is all what i have done so the start is defined before the for, start and end are defined before the for loop so how this would work is that uh, airflow would define one start task and the rest of them the get input predict and output result would be uh, defined in parallel to be executed and once all the three set of uh, that execution a uh, task execution is complete then finally it will be the end uh, task as you can see here just those few lines of change have changes have uh, made this uh, airflow task in, to run in parallel so i can just trigger the that now So as you can see, all these these three sets have have been executed in parallel, and the result has also been written. Should be here in the prediction. So what are you looking for now, uh, Alan? I'm looking for the second prediction. Yeah. Okay. But it should end up in the output folder. Yeah, okay. it should ideally end up in the output folder. Okay. Okay, that's fine. So we have uh, two, three expected, and we have the quality here, which is it says that first one should be five, and it predicted five, and the second one should be five, but it predicted six, like us. So we can see this is there. And, and what I'm trying to emphasize here is that uh, this config file, if, it, if this is something that is not predefined, or if it is, if it is something that changes dynamically, then uh, all you need to do is to define another one here. If you have a fourth one, or maybe a fifth one as well, then define them here. And that is all that you need to do to make this entire dot to make it uh, distributed. So it has become four, now you should see five. Let's do that. Yeah, now we can see all, all of that. But you're gonna trigger this error because we do not have the input data for these four and five. But if you have them in a in a different kind of environment, probably in production, where you it, it changes dynamically based on uh, the files in S3 or Azure Data Lake, then you can make that parameterize, which will automatically read them and predict the values and write the results as well. So apart from this uh, part, of, uh, 
apart from this, um, I have already described about how you can make within this task as well in parallel. So even, even that can be done within this as well. Uh, so if you have two set of output like this, output one, output this side two, and specify this is underscore one, underscore two. We can define them in the similar manner that I described earlier with the single tag as well. So we have defined something like this. Should be able to see the difference here. It will take a while for the scheduler to define and update this. I'm just going to refresh my table that Can you configure the refresh interval yes, as you, well? Yes, you can refresh the, so it has been uh, file process interval has been 10 and that will to refresh uh, list interval has been 30, 30 seconds. Okay, that's good to know. And uh, if we want, we can reduce this interval as yes, well. Yes, we can reduce the interval, but the, but the load on the database would be high. Uh, because yes. this configuration is fetched from the data. Yeah, each and every time the refresh happens, the scheduler sends process that serialize the data to the JSON and sends that JSON to the database, which might make the, uh, this might cause heavy load on the database. So do you have a recommendation on uh, uh, some production best practices? What uh, What is HMM running these configurations on? Uh -huh. That depends. Uh, so for for some scenarios where this this kind of execution can happen at any time. Mm -hmm. So in those scenarios, we have reduced the time interval to uh, reduce the refresh interval to thirty seconds. So it's it's like that. Uh, once a, once you get an updated config, then we need to, to trigger the DAG within thirty seconds. So mm -hmm. in that case. We have re reduced the re we have reduced the time interval, but in other scenarios, like for for example, if we have a data uh, in data processing pipeline, which is time specific, which we need to run on specific times, four times a day. So in those cases, we have reduced the refresh interval, uh, where we where that kind of delay is not specific and where we do not need the updated config. So in those scenarios, the DAG is mostly mostly predefined. So mm -hmm. in this case, it is dynamic and we, it is not predefined. We okay. do not know uh, well in advance how many uh, set of uh, executions it needs to do. Interesting. Hope it's clear. So uh, I have updated, just, just made the change and it have updated for all the set of uh, prediction inputs. So that's just one uh, quick thing that you could experiment with. So that was all uh, about the Airflow uh, implementation in uh, ML, uh, for, for ML, ML pipelines. So going back to the slides. As a, as a conclusion, uh, Airflow gives a complete interactive UI. And the best thing about Airflow is that the complete DAG definition is in Python, which is best for Python-based uh, uh, based projects. And especially that most of the ML uh, pipelines are currently built in, in Python. Uh, the, then the other best feature is about the dynamic creation of DAGs. You do not have to uh, rely on uh, a YAML kind of file where you define the DAG and where you need to manually populate the YAML file. Here, everything can be done dynamically based on an external configuration file. Uh, then, obviously, it provides large collection of operators uh, and also for multiple 
cloud services as well. Uh, very extensive set of operators, which would be which would make uh, really easy to do the deployment um, of uh, multiple processes. And it is easy to connect to other services, like I, how I have shown. It is easy to connect uh, to multiple services, such as uh, MLflow, where you want to track and log the module. Uh, so that is one of the best part about uh, using MLflow. That is our overall experience uh, of how we have been using MLflow over the past few years. Uh, just one more item to conclude is that uh, feel free to continue to use. So the environment that we have uh, shared with you, it should provide you a, a very good uh, starting point to have an overall understanding about airflow, how you can define the tasks such that it can be very easy to deploy in a production kind of environment. What we have shared in Docker Compose is, uh, is, a, is almost like an exact replica of what we use right now. We, but it's just on a more scaled environment, but it will be a good starting point for you to uh, start with. And we, based on the feedback that we receive, uh, we will continue to update the README with more defined instructions and also uh, refine the code base and the structure as much as possible so that we can continue to use this environment uh, in the future as well. Perfect. Any additional question? I have plenty of time to take questions. <laughs> Yes, I guess people that have questions can always reach out to you on Slack. Yes. Um, I saw that that you are there, Mustafa. You found uh, some help. Um, I hope you you managed to set it up on Ubuntu at some point and uh, follow the whole workshop instructions. Yes, we'll definitely try that and include that instructions for Ubuntu as well. We have tried on Mac and Windows. Uh, but never got the chance to try it. And definitely it. Yeah. yeah, it's difficult to cover all uh, operating systems. <laughs> yeah, and and also with the new M1 Max, it's different. That, that also is something if anyone is using it. All right. Uh, if there are no more questions, then it's just from my side to say thank you a lot, Ellen. And uh, thank you, Scott and Nitin and Lini that were sitting and answering questions in the uh, in the comments on the side and taking care that people could follow along. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Yeah. For this thank you a lot. Take care. Bye.